information out into a vector. Okay, so this is where these tools we just looked at can start applying. Uh, if we want to imagine that this information is uh, from a temperature sensor or is uh, pressure or anything else that you've been logging uh, and you want to you want to work with in the controller. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set MB10 here. Uh, what MB10 did is it cleared the row index and every second it's writing to the data table. Now we have a webinar on data tables. Uh, I don't want to go into this too much, but I'll just show quickly. We're writing to table one. We're taking our data from the generator and we're storing it into our uh, column at the row index MI24. We've used a conditional statement here that says when we get to 10, reset MB10 and stop writing to the data table. So if we want to take a look at the data table quick, We can go online and see the information stored in it. These values were just generated in the last 10 seconds. We'll leave here. And we can use our read columns tool. We're going to pull the information from table one. The column is temp, we only have one. And we're going to read from row number zero for 10 rows. We're going to store it into memory integer 0. We're going to give it an offset of 0. So again with these indirect and vector options, uh, the offset would allow us to place it uh, in, in offset from what we've defined as the start vector address. So if we said 10 as the offset, we would store this to memory integers 10, 11, 12, 13 uh, to 19. Okay. But we're going to save it back into or I should say write it back into our workspace MI0. So let's hit OK. We'll go back online. And we can watch MI0 here. And we'll read the information. Good. And so now instead of the information we had before from uh, MI1000 and MI1010, we have the information we've just logged in our data table. Now maybe it took an entire day to log this information to the table. It really doesn't matter how it got there, but what we have the ability to do now is pull an entire column or a part of a column down into a vector of memory integers and we can work on it with our tools. Uh, again, these are exactly the same, the vector sort. Maybe we can sort these. Let me see from lowest to highest. Again, we can sort from highest to lowest. Uh, we can compare, but uh, it's be so interesting. Uh, more interesting now, we can get the min and the max from this data that we've logged. Now, this is important because the data table is a great tool, and it's a great utility for logging and saving and gathering information, but we can't work in the data table with values. We need to pull them back out to the PLC. And pulling them back out as a vector is, uh, is very important to understand. Again, we have all these vector tools to use to work with this information. If we want to make something that is going to, say, collect and average the information, we can do that. Uh, we just need to understand how we're moving the information about. Okay. So this is, uh, again, a simple data table example. The first portion of it was just to generate some information. And then we have this one simple command to read the information back out from a column to a vector. Okay. We can see that right here. All right. So the next example, uh, just like we did with the data table, we're going to write using uh, an indirect store function. So we can talk about this quickly. Uh, if we click on store and store indirect, we'll see that we have a list of store indirect options. Now we have to select the one for the register type we're interested in. Uh, in this example, we're going to use the store indirect MI. But if I wanted to store to a memory long, I'd select ML. System long, I'd select SL. Uh, so what does storing indirect mean? Uh, storing indirect is a way that we can uh, take a piece of information and dynamically generate a location to store it in. Again, we're going to use the idea of vector 
and length, or vector and offset. Uh, in our example we saw previously, we were generating information in MI23. So what I want to do now is store that information from MI23 into MI0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. We saw one example where we pulled information out from the data table to do that. And now we're going to use a store indirect to build a vector as we go along. Now I've predefined this with a length of 10, but maybe you have a project and the interest is uh, 60 pieces of information. We just have to define the length of the vector to be 60 that we're going to work with, and we can, we can modify this to work. Um, but specifically what we're going to do here is when I set MB12, uh, I'm going to reset my pointer, and I'm going to write zeros to MIA0 with length 10. So I'm going to clear out this vector. I'm going to prepare our data, our new data, to be written to it. Okay. So uh, when MB12 12 is set again, uh, again, SB13 contact every one second, we're going to store indirectly. Now, the two parameters we have here, our data, in this case it's MI23, we're going to take the value from MI23 and we're going to store it in some memory integer which is defined by MI25. So the value that MI25 holds is going to be the memory integer we're going to write to. So if we see that when we start off we're resetting MI25, the offset or indirect pointer here, so we're going to do our first data log, or I should say indirect write, or indirect store, to MI25, oh, I'm sorry, MI0. We're then going to increment 25, so we'll see a 1. And when we come around again, we're going to store it at MI1. We increment again, it's now 2. We're going to store it at MI2, and so on. We've built a conditional below that says when MI25 is greater or equal to 10, reset MI12, so it'll stop this right. Okay. So we're building a vector here using an indirect store tool. Uh, I'm going to set MB12, and you should watch the space here, our workspace at MI0. We'll zero out, and then we'll start writing data to it. Okay, so our first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we've reset MB12. Okay, so again, this is an, this is a simple example of indirectly writing to a vector, we're building a vector. Uh, we can easily change this from a length of 10 with this conditional statement to 60 or 100. We don't have to do this based on SP13. We can have any time function we like here. If we want to store information uh, every day or every three hours, we can build a timer function for that. Okay. And again, we have our information in our vector. So we can go and you can use our tools, our vector, uh, <coughs> our compares, or our sorts, or our min and max again. We can also use the data table, write column tool, and we can write all this information from our vector back to the data table. We can do it in a whole column. So again, if we're taking temperature data and we're saving it, we can copy it back after we've modified it to the data table. Okay. Our next function we have is a shift register function. So we've used the vector fill already. We're going to use it again just to clear out our workspace. We're going to use our MI23, which was our sample data, and we're going to store MI23 into the first position and every second, we're going to shift it down to the right. So when we run this, we're going to be interested in copying nine pieces of data and storing one. So nine plus one is, is our uh, vector of ten. Uh, maybe we should run it, and then we'll talk about what it's doing. So again, watch the space here. When I set MB13, we're going to zero it out, and we're going to start copying information down from MI0 to MI9. 4, 5, 6, 
Notice that 2077 is moving down to the right every time. And when it gets to the end, it's gone. Uh, this is a shift register, or simple FIFO, first in, first out. Uh, we're, in this case, only interested in the last 10 pieces of data. So what we're doing specifically here is, every second, we're copying the information from MI0 to MI1 with a length of 9. That's going to leave a hole in MI0, and we're going to store the new information into MI0. And then we repeat this every second. So we copy down 9 items, we shift them down, <coughs> and we store the new information in the space we have avail uh, we've made available. Okay, this is, can as well be done with the data table, and you can see that in the data tables webinar we have. Okay, so <coughs> shift register functionality is very uh, is very useful, and um, this is a simple way to create it, just using a vector copy. All you have to do is remember to offset the destination by one from the start, and you set your length in the length parameter. Okay. We have another function that is called num to bit or bit to num. And again, we can find this vector bits to numeric or numeric to bit. What it allows us to do is take a number, an MI or a uh, DW or any of our registers and convert them into a vector of bits. So if we see our uh, example information here, we have our one second pulse incrementing, I'm sorry, incrementing MI29. Uh, you see every second it goes up by one. Uh, below that we have our numeric to bit function. So again, we have a number memory integer in this case, memory integer 29, which is a 16-bit value. And we're going to write the binary representation of this number across 16 bits. So our input, again, is MI29. Our output is some memory bit location. Again, this is going to be the start of a vector, MB100. And we've defined the length. Again, since the memory integer is 16 bits, I've selected 16. So every second, this is updating and writing the vector to MB100. And we can see that below here. We've put in our workspace MB100. Notice that the, uh, the least significant bit here is flipping every second. And we can watch the binary countdown. If I want to change this representation, uh, well, I, sorry, I can't change the binary. Um, we can see in the function below it, we're going from bit to numeric. So I'm going to take that same data we just converted to a vector of bits, and we're going to convert it back to a number. Similarly, our start address is now MB100. Our destination is now MI30. And our length, again, is 16, which you can see here is MI29 and MI30. MI29 is the result of the increment function, and MI30 is the result of the numeric to bit, and then the bit back to numeric. Okay, so why is this useful? Sometimes we store information as a memory integer, uh, like a bitmap, for example, of an error code. Uh, a bitmap can contain multiple pieces of information in a single number, but we won't be able to determine which bit is high or not without breaking it out into it's uh, without using numeric to bit. So we can make a couple compares here. We can say when the first bit is high or low, we have one error condition. The second bit's high or low, we have a, a different error condition. And this is useful because these bits can all be independent of each other without us having to create several different compare statements uh, for a memory integer. Okay. And there's a number of functions that work that way. In fact, if we look in the help file, uh, any of the uh, enhanced functions uh, will have their error messages uh, spelled out, and we can we can um, <coughs> reference those with their bitmap.